New, 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 new. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I'll kick it off. Uh, we're taking subscribers for Adabox. Adafruit.com slash Adabox. It's our subscription service. Every quarter, you get cool stuff from Adafruit. Here's a little video. Okay, we, um, we cut off subscriptions after a certain point, so go to adafruit.com slash adabox. Yeah, don't wait till the last minute, because there's no last minute. You no. will not be able to sign up. All right, it's time for my medicine. Okay. <laughs> this is... It's a syringe. The first new product of the week is the Chip Quick CP5S. This is a metal, you know, silver-based conductive paint, glue, ink, whatever. It's uh, metal, tin, silver copper you can look at the msds for the actual contents but this is basically a conductive fluid that you know dries and it, it's very low resistivity so it's good for uh, when you want to pass current through it um, but that said it's also like pretty flexible and it can be used for a lot of different things it's not non-toxic the same way um, bare conductive is bare conductive is like the other like carbon ish based um Conductive paint, but it's carbon based. Yeah, well, we are, okay. but it, it's it's higher resistivity. So this might be good. I mean, originally this stuff wasn't meant for like crafting. It's designed for um, fixing overhead. flex circuits and stuff. Let's see if I can zoom in. So you get um, a bunch of uh, you know this conductive paint glue, and it comes with a couple different tips. Let me I've got this tip. This one's a little bit big. Let me open this up and maybe get another one. Yeah. So you can you can remove the tips. You can use like standard lure lock tips, of course, okay. but it, it does come with two. And then um, yeah, you can gently squeeze it and make fine lines. And then you can um, you know also use tools like once you apply it. But you know a lot of times you'll see. Um, we see a lot of people who do like projects that are like, okay, make a uh, like conductive ink printer yeah. or um, you, know, you want to like put this in a, um, a 3D printer or something and like make weird. Oh, oh goodness. Everything collapsed. Um, Everything's okay. It's fine. Not, it's, it's from the 90s. It'll last no forever. No one saw that. Oh, um, wait, no Instagram did. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Mm, okay. Let's see. Why does this kind of. I guess it clogs a little bit. But yeah, basically, you know, you, you get this, um, you know, metal-based glue. You also, of course, um, just squeeze it out directly like this and then apply it with, um, you know, whatever tool you want. You can spread it thinly. And then it's high resistivity until you're done um, using it, let it dry. And then you can look at the data sheet. It's like only a couple ohms per uh, square inch compared to like, you know, like, 100 or 200 ohms for other conductive yeah. um, inks. The trade-off is it's more expensive. Like you're going to pay a lot more because it's, it's got silver and copper and tin in it. Yeah. And of course, it's not non-toxic. So, you know, this is yet another uh, crafty material that you can use for making um, weird conductive, you know, clothing or art or sensors. Yeah. Or if you want to repair flex circuits, um, sometimes this is also used for that. Yeah. If you're... Tin man friend needs a transfusion. Yes. All sorts of things. Okay. Let's so, keep doing this thing. There you thing. go. Okay. Okay. Um, next up. Next up, the thing I, I dropped on the floor. No. We'll fix it in I'll post. fix it in post. Yeah. So this is neat. I like this because I, I got an Xbox One because I only like one video game. Yeah. I don't play video games because I play this other video game called Adafruit. 
um, help you run this company and try to make the world a better place. So that video game, we play on the hard level in high heels doing backflips and um, eating bowls of glass. However, there is a video game I'm quite fond of and it's called Whacked. Yes. And it's one of the hardest video games I played on the hard level and um, you can only play it on Xbox One. That's right, um, and you, you can't use it, like, yet. we tried playing it on the Xbox... Uh, you can, it's like, sorry, wrong firmware. So, um, one of the things about the Xbox One, though, is it doesn't have HDMI out. That's right. So if you Which we have, learned. Yeah, which we, we have, one. you know, a hard time now, because everything is HDMI. So, do you want me to go to the overhead? Yeah, let me see if I... I hope I didn't like I'll just it. keep showing this picture. Hold on. Oh, you know what, the Xbox turned off. Oh, yeah? Well, I think we didn't play it for, like, an hour, because we were... We we're setting up, so. So, anyways. Um, Here you go. Oh. Memories. Yeah. So this is yeah. So this is um, an Xbox. Well, we got this Xbox so you could play Whacked, but uh, it's also a great demo of this HDMI yeah. converter. So, if you have old devices like you know, for example, oh, I'll turn the volume down. If you have like an Xbox or like an old Nintendo or um, some old computers, you know, if you have an Apple II, it has composite out. Um, and you want to use it with a modern monitor or projector or or whatever, and it only has HDMI in, which most TVs these days only have HDMI in. Maybe they have VGA if you're lucky. Um, you want to use some older stuff. So you would use a converter box like this. And this converter box takes video in, and you can use a CCAM, which is rare, but some people have it, PAL or NTSC, and then left and right audio, white and red, so standard uh, composite. And then on the other side, you get HDMI, and the HDMI is audio and video combined. So like this is a monitor that has um, video and audio, so you can, you know, you could hear when I was booting it up, the speaker volume, the speakers were playing the audio. You can also get the audio out from the little port over here if you're using like a monitor that doesn't have speaker. And then you can select the output format to uh, 720p or 1080p. Um, so these are more expensive than ones, we have the other way. So yeah. we have a converter that takes HDMI and decodes it and gives you composite. That's really easy. It's way harder to take um, composite and then audio and convert it into HDMI. And so this is a, a more expensive box. Um, but, you know, if you have an old Xbox and you really want to use it, this is the only way. You know, our TV doesn't even have um, composite, which is no. pretty amazing. The only thing you have to watch out for is, even though this gives you 1080p or um, uh, uh, 1080p or 720p, um, just because it has 720p or 1020p, uh, 1080p output doesn't mean it actually turns your video into like no. high definition. Like you're just going to get the same same crappy video, just kind bigger. of crappy, fuzzy, yeah. you know, video. It's not. I mean, it's not like horrible, but it's 480p. It's not going to be HD, and it's just um, projected in 720. So this, it's pretty good. You yeah. know, and if you have like an old TV, it would look fine because the TV just didn't do any better. But just when you get it, if you use it and you're like, ah, oh, like it isn't like super sharp HD. Yeah, it doesn't actually do like remastering yeah. of the video. This is endless appetizers. They don't get better. It's the same appetizers. <laughs> it's like okay. A very good analogy. So um, that said, this does work really well. We use it at home with our Xbox. Yeah, and or as I like to call it, the whacked appliance. Yeah. <laughs> because that's all it plays. Okay. Okay. Uh, next up. Let's keep moving. Let's move on. All right. I'm gonna Got get some Bluetooth away. stuff going on here. These are updated products, but they're updated enough. Upgrades. They're updated upgrades, so I thought we would mention them. Um, so, hold on, let me put this okay. away. Okay, I'm just going to show the photos while you do all this stuff. Oh, you know what? I did not bring those up, so I don't no, have who the, cares? So we'll show the photos. Okay, so these I are... I have a video. These are updated. Yeah, we'll, we'll have the video about Bluetooth. So these are an older product. They're the Bluetooth Friend and Bluetooth Sniffer. Um, and the thing about these now is that we have redesigned the board to make it lower cost. We've lowered the price. And the uh, USB converter chip is now a Scilabs chip, not an FTDI chip. Um, we really prefer the Scilabs chip. We found it has better performance. Yeah. And, again, the price is lower. Yeah. So overall, good. Um, other people than are very passionate about that particular function that's cool. of a chip. That's cool. The um, board. So basically, the only real update is... The price is nice, too, on the, the Scilab ship. The price is very nice. The price is right. Very nice. Uh, and that, along with removing the SWD connector, which, like, almost nobody used, um, allowed us to drop the price on both of these. So the 
uh, USB, they look the same because they're the same hardware, but we load different firmware on them. The sniffer is the device you'd want to use if you want to listen on a Bluetooth device. It's great for reverse engineering or um, development work if you want to monitor your Bluetooth, make sure it's working, or like, you know, you want to, you know, use it with some other device. I don't know. All sorts of like Bluetooth sniffing, hacking, reverse engineering. That's a useful tool. Yeah. And we also have a version that has our Bluetooth friend firmware. What that's useful for is if you want to communicate with um, a tablet or an, a, um, a phone that has Bluetooth yeah. and you want to act as a client device. Um, again, really useful for development if you want to have um, like a, a custom interface or you want to make sure that your connectivity is going or you just want to send data to and from a tablet to your computer. Even though some computers have Bluetooth in them, um, like Windows 7 doesn't have native support, and even like Linux, which does have some support, it's a real pain in the ass to get using. This tool will let you basically use yeah. USB to serial instead of like having to use Blues yeah. or Bluetooth OSX. Bluetooth is a giant mess. We tried our, Total mess. our best for makers to fix it, and um, we like to make Bluetooth friends. Yeah. That's why we call it Bluetooth friends. Yeah. Um, if there was only like a four-minute-ish video where someone like Colin explain Bluetooth. Well, Colin's great at explaining stuff like this. Oh, wait, there is. Yay. Take it away, Colin. You've heard of Bluetooth for connecting audio and other peripherals wirelessly. Bluetooth Low Energy is sort of the next generation of Bluetooth. And as the name implies, it uses a lot less power. Bluetooth Low Energy uses less energy by keeping things simple. Instead of maintaining a constant connection, the BLE protocol only sends data as needed, and it does so with very little overhead. This means it's great for periodic updates, like getting readings from a sensor, but it's not so great for streaming audio or video. For now, that's a job best left to classic Bluetooth or even better, Wi-Fi. Probably the biggest reason that BLE is so great for DIY is the fact that companies like Apple and Google have made it so easy for developers to use. Someone writing an app for iOS or Android can easily add in BLE support without needing any special certification or contending with any legal hurdles or anything like that. It's definitely a good thing. But you don't have to be an app developer to use BLE in your project. The Bluefruit LE Connect app is a free download for iOS and Android that works as a multi-purpose tool when communicating with BLE devices. It includes a terminal-like interface for sending and receiving text, a controller mode that can send orientation, color, and control pad messages, and even a firmware updater for upgrading BLE peripherals wirelessly. Well, that's all nice and everything, but how can you use it? Well, let's look at a few examples. Here I have a temperature sensor and a BLE breakout board connected to an Arduino Uno. Once I've connected my phone to the BLE board, the code I have running on the Arduino gets a value from the sensor every five seconds and sends it back to my phone. So here, data is being sent out from the BLE peripheral device and is retrieved by the BLE central device, my phone. But data can, of course, move in the opposite direction as well. This little red rover uses a Feather microcontroller board with an integrated BLE module. The Feather uses a separate motor controller board to drive the two servo motors on the wheels. All of this is controlled using the Bluefruit app's control pad interface. Data is sent from my phone out to the rover every time I touch down on a button and every time I release it. Here I'm using another BLE feather, but this time with an RGB LED matrix attached. Using the app's color picker, I can send a color value over to the board in RGB format. The feather then writes this value to all of the LEDs. Oh, and one more interesting way to use BLE is as a beacon. This allows a BLE device to work as a sort of 
proximity sensor. And I don't even have to find, choose, and connect to it beforehand. When functioning as a beacon, my BLE Feather continually broadcasts what's called advertising data, containing a specific identifier string I wrote to it earlier. I also registered this string with the Beacon app called Locate, which is running on my phone. My phone will continually scan nearby BLE advertising data, and once it comes into range of the feather, it'll find a match for that string and display a notification. Oh, and in case you're wondering, Bluetooth, which is a relatively odd name, was named after Harald Bluetooth, a Viking king who united Denmark and Norway. Apparently, he knew how to use power efficiently as well. Well, I'm off to unite some devices myself, so go make something with BLE, and you'll be able to do stuff like this. Okay, and the star of the show tonight, besides you, Lady on this episode of Ask an Engineer, is this? What is this? This is our latest Nindoff sensor, but this is a really nice Nindoff sensor. Um, nine degree of freedom. This has a three axis gyro, three axis accelerometer, and three axis magnetometer. But unlike uh, our other Nindoff sensors, this one is really high precision, um, really high quality sensor set. It's from NXP. We actually um, saw these first in um, a, a teensy uh, prop wing. And we're like, wow, check out the specs on these. Uh, the gyro in particular, it, the precision was like 10 or 100 times better than um, any of the other sensors we have. And that actually makes a big difference when you're doing orientation sensing because you have to, uh, you know, you have to integrate over all the sensor data. And if the sensor data starts drifting, um, your orientation data starts drifting. So this set, the FXO and FXA from NXP, when, when used together, basically get you, as far as we can tell, um, this is the best on the market uh, nine degree of freedom sensor for stability and precision. And we even have a version of AHRS, which is um, you know the orientation fusion uh, software that you can run on your Arduino or your Feather or pretty much any processor. They'll take that data and take the you know, acceleration, magnetometer, and gyroscope and give you orientation so you can tell you know which way you're facing and whether you're pointing down or up or turning. And it does a really good job. Um, it's a little tougher to use than the BNO055, which is our orientation sensor that has um, the microcontroller built in, but it's a lot less expensive. So if you don't mind having to run our library code on your microcontroller, maybe you have a microcontroller that's powerful enough or has enough flash, um, you basically get kind of the best of all both worlds, the low cost, high precision orientation sensing, and it's not too big either. Okay, let's uh, answer a question specifically mm -hmm. about this. Does um, the FX OS 8700 have sensor fusion? If not, does the library handle it? This library handles all of it. That's the trade-off. The sensors themselves are, are dumb sensors. They don't do the fusion on their own. However, our library code very easily takes this data. You do a little bit of calibration if you want the best performance, and then out of the box, it pretty much just works. But okay. you have to run our library code on your microcontroller. It takes up 15K of flash. So if you're using like an Arduino Uno and you have like a ton of code for doing other things, you may not have that extra 15K. That said, if you're running something like an M0 or like an STM processor, you're gonna have tons of extra flash space. It's not a big deal for you to do the sensor fusion in mm. the microcontroller. And then you have a lot of control over like how fast you wanna run it and when you wanna run it and calibration and all that okay. good stuff. Choices choices. All right. But a really nice sensor set. I think uh, if you look at the specs compared to the MPU series or the LSM series, uh, this one is pretty top notch. Okay. Well, with that is new products. Good work, Lady Ada. Yay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>